<laughs> I'm doing great. How Good. are you? Thank you for coming on again. You bet. If you guys, so here, if you guys haven't seen the other interviews we've had with him, we've talked about several different things in the past couple of days with you. Uh, you guys can go to siliconangle.tv and everything will be archived there. Oh, I think you're, uh, you're going for the, the Cube alum record here. I think this, actually, <laughs> actually, I think Pat Gelsinger has it, but uh, you're right How there. How many times has Pat been on here? Let's see, you're getting close. I think Pat's been on, what, five times? Uh, so let's see, you, you, you had twice it. Uh, this is your fifth time. No, I yeah, do it twice at VMworld. Did I do we twice two there? segments? Okay. Well, we count, it, we'll, oh. we'll count the Heineken one as twice. We did the press conference with Heineken, right, that's right. Right. and then you did a big interview with me. At, you might even have them here. You did a big interview with me and Heineken, and then you and well, I. If the, if the readers are demanding, the listeners are demanding it, right? You got to deliver, go. right? Yeah, give, of give course. them what they want. They want Phil. And, and we even got Dave away from HP's uh, show, too, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. That was Just nice, yeah. I took the red eye in last <laughs> yeah. night, and uh, they weren't too happy. But, uh, you guys were hanging out at Epcot yesterday. We were watching the fireworks, you know, there at the Epcot Center, and I didn't, I didn't stick around for the fireworks. I'm kind of bummed now. Yeah, it was good. You know, I, it's like I said to Callie last night. I was tweeting. It, uh, I said it wasn't the same without my kids. You know, yeah, having the kids at Disney. Yeah, just, there's nothing like Epcot. Some I felt like Disney, Disney World a little better, but yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. You mean uh, Magic Kingdom? Uh, yeah, I like the rides. Yeah, <laughs> Space Mountain or whatever it is. Yeah. Yep. I need a real education in the Disney World experience because there are all these different parks and all yeah. these different sections, and I don't honestly know much about it. I've never been. This is my first time even on the property. You've, you've lived a deprived childhood. I know. Yeah. Parents, what were you thinking? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Do you watch all the time? Oh, no. They're not. <laughs> no. Talking, it's cool, actually. Talking tech you know, on the cube. It's, it's confusing. It's daunting to the, for the first time Disney visitors, right? You try to it really map is, through all that yeah. stuff. You know, Phil, you, you're good at simplifying things. Maybe you could come up with a new product there to help the Disney visitors <laughs> figure out where they need to start. D- you know, Disney for it, dummies, right? Yeah, Disney right, for exactly, dummies, exactly. exactly. I don't think that sells very well, right? <laughs> Maybe Actually, you, you know can what? also simplify a tech startup world That's for right. us as well. You, hey, so, you know, it was funny last night seeing you with customers. You you love customers, don't you? Yeah, yeah I, I, you do. I, I guess I'm an outgoing kind of guy that likes to... And they like you. I mean, we, well, I know uh, it's kind of weird. A lot of our customers, they're, they're, they're friends now too, right? Uh, you know, when you're uh, negotiating the deal to get in the door with them, they, they hit you hard and tell you they don't trust you and all that stuff. But uh, after you get to know them and you deliver for them, you kind of have been friends with them. I think that's a good learning is you can never have enough friends. That's right. <laughs> it, I, I'm real sincere. They are friends. So I really appreciate what they've done. And it's, it's more fun to like who you're dealing with versus uh, having to be a vendor for them, right? We were, uh, let's see, last time I talked to you, we were at VMworld. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, and, and the three-par acquisition was going forward, and I was asking you, you were a real poker face about it, you know. And uh, and so now, look at this. Wow, bang. Yeah. Dell. Well, is that a culture uh, shock for you? or? It's, uh, you know, the, there's, uh, the, the cultures are really similar. There's just a lot of them, is the way I describe it there. You know. Yeah. We had uh, 600 employees. They got 110,000. So, uh, you know, that's a little different there. But, you know, I used to work at IBM, so it's, it's uh, a little bit of deja vu for me, too. Yeah, an interesting, yeah, an interesting background for a, for a CEO really of, a, of a startup yeah. and a couple of startups. I mean, you were a math teacher, right? Junior high math teacher, yeah. Taught uh, junior high math, algebra, all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, you gotta when you teach math, I guess you, it, to, to little kids, you got to be able to take complex ideas and simplify it. Is that kind of where you hone that skill? Or? Mm-hmm. I think it helped. You know, I, I remember when I started at IBM, they used to uh, you know rank the classes, 1 to 30 or whatever, and uh, I did real well in those classes. Because most people that are smarter than I are, their books on. They went to Harvard and MIT and all that kind of stuff. I went to the University of Northern Colorado, but they. Uh, what happened is they couldn't present. They couldn't be, you know, react on their feet. You know, be dynamic and that yeah. kind of. Be fluid, right? So fluid. I learned how to be fluid when I was a math teacher. In junior high, you really better be fluid because uh, you don't know what's going to hit you every hour, let alone uh, every day. So you worked for IBM, which mm-hmm. obviously IBM. You know, I was saying to Callie yesterday, Callie's a little younger than I am, and uh, <laughs> but you remember IBM used to have 50% of the revenues of the computer business yeah. and, and 60% of the, two-thirds of the profits, actually. Mm-hmm. That was a true monopoly, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and getting training at IBM, is like, it's like getting training at Xerox. You know? I mean, it, it, was, it was unbelievable. You know, this is 82 for me, so I was kind of at the tail end of the big hiring curve at IBM, but back then they didn't really have any computer boring. science degrees. You know, so yeah. they were, uh, you, they trained the industry, really, back then. Mm-hmm. They had a... Uh, my training was a year long, so I'd literally I'd go to Dallas for a month, I'd come home for a month, go to Dallas for oh, a month, wow. home. and it was they had a, a fake company. The uh, actually I just saw I, I couldn't remember the name. It's the Armstrong Sporting Goods Company, 
and they had a fake company down there and they had their own annual report and mm. you'd call on the CEO one time, the CFO another day, the you know, sell typewriters one day because back then, I mean, yeah. the typewriters all the yeah, way up to right. main What are printers, typewriters? So. I know, you don't know. <laughs> so you'd have to learn to talk their language. That's right. And they did this in Dallas. They did in Dallas. Can you imagine having to spend that much time in Dallas? I know. Uh, oh, no, <laughs> I can't. I mean, I just live there. Is that where you live? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a fun city, actually, yeah. It's a good city. Yeah. Chaparral Creek, do you know what that is? No. That's where we stay there, out there, but. Um, I'll have to look it up. So, yeah. so what got you into the startup business? I mean, how'd you do that? Yeah, that was, uh, yeah, I look back now, I don't know how to, what was I thinking I did this, but uh, so I was at IBM, you know, I did the fast track career, we ended up uh, moving to Minneapolis, was the branch manager there, and then right before I left IBM was the business exec in charge of the PC and networking group there, but uh, I didn't want to, you know, they would want me to move to Armonk, New York, I had four kids, uh, that didn't sound real good, you're in a commission job to a non-commission job in New York, I mean, it's like really going backwards in your career. But uh, I always wanted to do something entrepreneurial. You know, even as a little kid, I used to do things like, you know, start your own little companies or whatever you do there. And I was a ball boy for the Denver Nuggets. You know, I, I do entrepreneurial things, I guess. So they, uh, I went to work for a small software company. And uh, the thing that was really good there is that uh, it, it got sold for just a little bit of money. It wasn't really a big success, but the uh, CEO let me help him raise money. You know, you don't learn about fundraising at IBM. so. He let me kind of vicariously learn through him. He raised the money, but I got to see how he did it, and that was that ended up being a very key skill for that me. That was a Minneapolis-based company. That was a Minneapolis-based company called Prodia Software. Yeah. Prodia Software. It's one of the hardest things for people to get into, you know, their own business because you have to have so many different skills. Yeah. Finding that right mentor or finding that right partner to mm -hmm. to help train you in those areas yeah. is key, and it's it's not really. I, if you think differently, let me know. But it's hard to force that. Yeah. You know, I mean, how do you find that person? You know, a little bit. It's it's uh, it's a little luck, frankly. Yeah. Um, you gotta seek it out a little bit too. Uh, but fundraising, if you're gonna start your own company, it's a very key thing. And yeah. you know, there's a lot of strategies you can do. And even when you do it with them, you don't. You gotta either have it. You don't. I, I honestly, I think on that True. stuff, you either have it or you don't. Yeah. Uh, it's it's different than selling, but it's similar to selling, but it's different. But uh, you know, we, uh, I always say there's three big risks in a startup. You got the first one is financing. Mm -hmm. If you don't have the right money or enough of it, it's probably not going to work. Um, I actually think in storage, if you get in, in a lot of technology companies, if you get overfunded, it can actually be bad too. Sure. Because you get sloppy, you get, you know, you're not quite as lean, mean, and tough as you should you be. You got to find that balance. Yep. Yeah. And then, uh, so number one is financing. Number two is the technology, which obviously is key what you're going to do. And number three is distribution. And uh, most people focus on uh, number two too much, mm -hmm. frankly. Uh, and uh, VCs and you know, venture capitalists don't focus on number three enough. Uh, distribution is just, it's, it's key. You can have yeah. a mediocre product, and if you have a great distribution strategy and sell a lot of it, you're going to do better than the guy who has the, the product everyone's going to wait to come by for him. So, so how did you learn that distribution part? I mean, what, what was your focus there? Yeah, I think that there it's, uh, you got to react to what the, the market's like there. So, you know, I'll give you an example. My, uh, the first storage startup I started there, you know, uh, not only were we a new company, but SANS were a new concept. So okay. you better be pretty hands-on and direct because uh, yeah. no one else knows what it is. So you better, <laughs> you better control who's telling them what it is. So now with Compellent, we saw in 2002, you know, SANS are ubiquitous. Everybody knows about it. There's a... A lot of people have been educated on that front. It's too complicated. So now it was how do you get to as many people as you possibly can. Yeah. And so we uh, we had a lot of innovations, but I think one of them was we interviewed the, everyone's going to use the reseller channel, but they usually say, well, we'll do 20% direct and the rest uh, uh, through the channel. Yeah. And uh, we, we talked to them, they hated it, you know, because they were competing with their vendor all the time. So yeah. we went 100% channel and okay. helped us scale ourselves. Innovation in, uh, in the distribution was yeah. the real yeah. secret there. Yeah. So, so when you, John, and Larry started your first company, mm -hmm. you, you knew those guys before, obviously, yeah. right? You'd met well, I, company, actually, you know? I didn't. Uh, Larry was my next door neighbor. Okay. So that was kind of how we met. And he worked at a you know, different company, but... Uh, and if you, if, you know, if you know us, we're totally different personalities. So we weren't hanging together on Saturday night. You know, we'd see each other mowing the lawn, mm -hmm. but, you know, you weren't uh, hanging out. I, I, I was more sports. He was cars. You know, it was different different personalities. But How would John come into this? Um, John and Larry go way back. They, you know, grew up in the same neighborhoods, but they, they'd worked at uh, four different companies together. So, okay. Uh, so when Larry said, well, let me introduce you to John, we met at a little sandwich shop and the rest is kind of history then right so so, so you it had was really luck you know location 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 yeah <laughs> my next door neighbor right? so you had had some experience raising money from the software company mm -hmm. and, and then how'd you fund 
uh, Zyotech? So we started out there, uh, the original uh, $886,000, not that I remember exactly how much we raised there. <laughs> and how many cents? It was from, uh, yeah, was from uh, angel investors. So we started with angel investors. Um, we uh, you know, there's a the Olympic Hills Country Club bar is where we raised most of it. Honestly, you know, we, uh, we found one guy that uh, kind of was kind of a rainmaker for us. Introduced us to a lot of uh, individuals there. Um, there's some fun stories actually about that. I remember the the first check I got was a guy uh, Joe Newman, and we did the presentation to him, and he said, "Phil, come out in the parking lot with me." I, I know I was going to get beat up or what, but he pulled out his checkbook, wrote a fifty thousand dollar check, and said, uh, "Make sure I get in the deal. I'm going to Vegas tomorrow, and I don't want to miss it." And uh, wow. I've never seen Joe since. That's the last time I saw him. But, <laughs> but, he, uh, but, but Joe check. did well. He, he, he made he made thirty x his money, so he's a pretty happy yeah. guy. Yeah, I think he was real happy there. So we uh, raised that, and, and then we went over to venture capital, you know, traditional venture capital, and uh, you know, raised out in total about twenty eight million dollars. Mm -hmm. And Compellent raised about fifty-three million, and we did all venture there. So, well, right so, so Compellent in some ways was was easier to fund because you'd done it before, you'd sold the company. But when so you went from the 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 angel investing to the sort of I guess the A round of, yeah. of the VC. Yeah. Um, where were you at in the company? Did you? I mean, uh, you know, East Coast, West Coast, it's really different. I, I don't know what it's like in, in Minneapolis yeah. in terms of. Do you had had you had to have some traction? Did you have to show? Was it you know showing a business plan? What was the climate like yeah. back then? Uh, no, at Compellent or the no the, at, at the first company, yeah, the Series A. So they um, kind of I mean, where you, were you revenue wise? Yeah, what we always try to do is uh, you raise some money and yeah. you want to have it take you to a milestone, and plus I say six months because it really takes about six months to close around. Uh, people think they can do it in three, but it's you know right. it's six months where you really figure out start to finish. Yeah, right. So so I'll give you an example. Uh, yeah, the idea we raised the first venture round after we had the first kind of beta unit or alpha unit. So you'd kind of proven that some of the technical concepts were going to work and then a little bit of time there. And then the next one, you know, you want to have that money last you long enough till maybe you're at the five million in revenue mark, you know, so you always want to get enough to take it a milestone plus six months is the, the what and I And then did you do the another rumors. raise after the, the Series A? Yeah, we did uh, Series uh, three, three rounds. Three more rounds and then yeah. ended, up, ended up selling the company to Seagate, right? To Seagate, yeah. yeah. And then but it's, uh, yeah, fundraising is really hard. It's it's uh, it's really it's, time consuming, right? Very yeah, time consuming. Yeah. You know, a lot of entrepreneurs out there, like, all right. And the biggest question: How did you get started? How do I get started? Right. Where mm -hmm. do I go? Do I, you know? And, and it's just like you said. You and, know, you and, to, and if you're in Minnesota, it's a little tougher too, because uh, a lot of the VCs have left that town. Yeah. So and uh, you know, the, you know, hear the expression that I'm not going to invest in somebody that's not 30 minutes from my doorstep. Well, they're all in Silicon Valley. So yeah, they hate yeah. travel. That's a long so. drive to yeah. Minnesota. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then they're afraid of the weather. You know, these. So that that was a challenge too. Then Compella was a little different, though. Uh, we'd been successful. We'd made people a lot of money, so that helps get people in the door, obviously. But it was 2002, and yeah, so VCs were licking their wounds in 2002. And they were looking for, hey, get to whatever, five, ten million, show me a profit, and then then, then I'll come in. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, <there's, laughs> we don't need you. Yeah. <laughs> there's always, as I say, VCs are always motivated to say maybe. Yeah. You know, the longer they wait, the more desperate you get for the money. And then the other thing is the more they get to see how well you're doing before they put their money at risk. So, um, how, how were you sure that you needed VC money rather than, you know, because you talked about getting uh, a little bit of angel and, you know, versus family investment versus right. angel and, and VC? Um, so here's what I always tell entrepreneurs, you know, they ask for advice is figure out, you know, the kind of thing you're trying to do, how much money you're going to need for five years. And that determines what kind of money you need. So if you have an idea that you know might take a couple hundred thousand dollars and for your total of investment there, um, that might be families and friends. You know, yeah. if you're gonna need a couple million, you might be able to do that with angels. But if you're gonna need 20, 30, 40 million to build a data storage company or whatever, yeah. you're probably gonna go to VCs. Gonna... And it's really important to figure that out up front because I've seen a lot of uh, entrepreneurs raise any money they can get early on, and you yeah. can actually plant cancer that's gonna kill you later on. Yeah. So if you Talk have a little bit. If you have like a hundred angel investors, the VCs probably aren't going to touch you later on because right. they don't want to deal with that many, okay. you know, uh, smaller investors. Because uh, when times get tough, yeah. it's tough to control those kind of that numbers of people. So, sure, I think um, another example you might get some strate uh, strategic investors to invest in you, but that'll prevent another one from buying you. So you got to be careful. You got to have a long-term plan on that uh, yeah. that front there. So Can't 2002, right? The dot-com bubble exploded. Then 9/11 just crushed the technology yeah. industry, and it was a very slow recovery. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so you raised the money in 2002, and, and of course, mm -hmm. even even I mean, 
companies like EMC at the time were reeling out of the dot and NetApp and mm -hmm. they were hurting. And so now you were coming in and said, hey, we got a better idea than what these guys have. Mm -hmm. That must have been, like you say, a little hard to pitch the VCs on it. Um, how, how'd you do that? Well, um, the charm. Th that's right. Come you know, on. That's how could he not? A, a, a smart VC, ultimately, they're investing in the team. So I think we had the team, so that helped there. Um, it's actually a fun story we had. I mean, Charles Beeler. Right? That's right. Early on, that's right. He was the Eldorado. first guy. He's yep. great. great. Charles, He's been a cube guest a couple of times. Charles Beeler and uh, Jeff Hank were the first yeah. two. So uh, we actually had a closing dinner uh, a few weeks ago, and, and we got all those guys together. And they were telling the story, actually, when I first went to pitch them on the uh, investment idea. I asked them if I could bring my daughter, who was a senior in high school at the time, and she had to do some project where she had to watch you know, some business event happen or whatever. So, yeah. So I had her sit right behind me, and they said, "Yeah, you know, the teary-eyed daughter behind you." They, it was a sympathy investment. Yeah. They did with us. So uh, yeah. that was funny there. But we had uh, the other thing I tell the, the entrepreneurs: get a compatible investor. Um, don't just get the money and with somebody you may not like hanging out with uh, a little while later. And our, our VCs were fantastic. So they weren't vulture capitalists. They were. You know, they're, they're friends too. We end up being friends with them. Too. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. So, but, but I mean, that's hard, right? Uh, it's it's hard to tell the the good ones from the bad ones. So you got to do a lot of homework as mm -hmm. an entrepreneur, don't you? We got you know, um, you got to talk to your peers, and uh, a lot of them won't be honest because if they got the money from them, they're not going to say anything bad right. about it. Oh yeah, them. we love those guys. Live with them. So yeah. you gotta, you really gotta, you know, look at it very critically. scratch a little deeper yeah. Yeah, before you do it. And it's hard when you're starting a company. You're kind of desperate to get the investment, so. Uh, I just talked to my brother-in-law who's starting a company yesterday and you know you gotta get the right kind of investors and you could see him yeah. struggling with that right now already so and then you, you 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 were a part of this what I call the storage renaissance you know you mm -hmm. had you know guys like uh, compellent uh, data domain three par that were yeah. solving real problems I mean that's kind of where it starts right Bipper says well, you gotta solve a problem mm -hmm. and it's true you guys were solving a problem which was complexity and storage right, right? You used to say it's probably still do. We wanted to bring all these mainframe class features down to the you know, exactly. small, mid-sized business. It's, uh, you know, I think the first thing that happened is once network storage came in, there was room for innovation. So, you know, in, in the old days, we had the direct attached storage. Once the open systems went to network attached storage, you could, uh, you could come out and do some innovation and do some creative things. And it, a lot of the innovation is really uh, kind of re, um, similar to what happened in the, me the mainframe uh, renaissance. So, you know, hierarchical storage management was out there. You know, VM was a you know, a mainframe operating system. Now look at virtual machines, right? It's uh, there's a lot of, you know, history repeats itself there. But dedupe uh, is the only new thing I found when I left the storage business ten years ago and came back. It was dedupe was the only thing I'd never seen before. Yeah, <laughs> I, was, I just talked to a customer said that uh, MI, uh, Carnegie Mellon. They said, yeah, we had thin provisioning back in 1980. You know, so yeah. But I, I, I talked the other day that uh, on the cube here about the. In the, the, that decade, though, where all this innovation has come up, the legacy vendors really didn't provide it, though. I mean, I don't think, you know, look at primary storage, you know, thin provisioning, automated tiered storage, tracking at a platter level, uh, replay architectures, live volume, none of them come from a legacy vendor. They've all say they have it now, but uh, the innovation came from, uh, you know, more nimble, fluid companies. It's interesting, because you, you're at IBM, you weren't in the storage group. Um, I was actually a storage specialist in the mid-80s. Oh, okay, yeah. good. So I didn't know that. So in my little first staff job, I was the, the guy who'd go out and sell the, the mainframe DASD devices. So, so you remember well systems managed storage, yeah. DFSMS. And so I, I was a little pop analyst at IDC. And, and of course, IBM at the time was everything. Yeah. So I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make my name on. as a storage analyst because I'm going to know SMS better than anything. I think oh, I this is it. the hottest thing. So I would read all the what technical documentation. Yeah. Right. And I was like a little mini geek. But here's the thing. When I, I left the business and uh, came back, I had a CIO consultancy and did a software company. And came back and said I wanted to do the research thing. Mm -hmm. One of the first companies I met was Compellent. They gave me a briefing. I don't know why they chose me. They called up a PR firm and said, oh. hey, we want to brief you. And they described what you were doing with automated tiering. And I said, no way. This is like SMS, right? Yeah. And I said, does it really work? And they said, yeah, <laughs> sure. And I remember calling up my colleague, David Flores, saying, you got to check this company out. And uh, and of course, you never know whether it's true or not. Yeah. You know, it's you know, he's, he's so many say. stories, and so, and so he looked at it and said, "This is fantastic." And then obviously, you know, we watched you guys explode. So, uh, it's you know, right call, good call. It was, uh, <laughs> it, it's good, uh, and it's you know, we have a lot of software features, and uh, they're all by themselves really good, mm -hmm. but they they kind of all work together to make each other better. So, you know, we use the replays in our tiered storage. We use the replays in our replication. I mean, so it's, it's neat how that all works together. Thin provisioning helps the replication, you know, 
and uh, you know the power of multiple features working together, written by one yeah. team, not yeah. snapped on from somewhere else, which uh, others have tried to do. Yeah, the clean slate. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, so you, you 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 did that, very successful. Uh, I wonder if you could talk about um, the whole. You know, we were talking about raising money before. East Coast and West Coast VC seem to be somewhat different right now. East Coast a little bit more conservative. West Coast, uh, do you think we're in a bubble? <laughs> Uh, I think for the social media side, there's a big bubble going on. Uh, I think in storage, there was one, you know, in the early 2000s. Yeah. Uh, you know, we had you know, a lot of people made money on uh, exit strategies back in 2000. Uh, then there was kind of the hiatus, uh, hiatus there. there. There's a little bit of a bubble, I think. Yeah, um, is that a good thing? Or? It seems like there's another storage one coming on now, too. There's a lot of... Well, that's what I want to talk about. What's kind of surprised me, it's kind of coming on now. Is, that a, yeah. is, is, is a bubble a good thing or a bad thing for entrepreneurs? Uh, it's good things for the entrepreneurs because okay. yeah. the, the, <laughs> the money flows a little quicker. And what about for, for yeah. business in general? I mean, yeah. is it, is it are these, are these you know, bubbles that hurt the last one, but this one feels like there's more innovation going on. There's I feel uh, like we're in an innovation cycle here. And storage is, is right at the center of it, too, which is kind of neat to see that, that activity there. But talk about that a little bit because 2010, we, you know, John Furrier, my co host, mm -hmm. co you know, coined the term storage is sexy, you know, yeah. talking to all the CEOs about why. So in 2010 was a sexy storage year, right? A lot of acquisitions. And, <laughs> and so do you, so you're talking about, you're saying you're seeing another sort of big spate of storage investments. Where is it? The cloud? Uh, the on ramps? Or? Well, they're, they're, they, they try to tie it on to other trends. Some is. Uh, Big data. I, so it's like marketing <laughs> hype, if you yeah. know what I mean. But uh, you got the flash stuff. You got yeah. the, uh, yeah, Fusion the cloud stuff. You got the, you know, they tend to drip, grab on a trend and go with it here. So I think, you know, one thing you got to do is you got to evaluate, is that a feature or is that a company? Mm -hmm. And when you look at these investments and the features don't make it, you know, and some, some VCs fund those things. But uh, so that, that's a big challenge. If you look at the 2000 class, not many made it. There's a lot of money invested and not many made it. So, uh, right. You know, and they raised, you know, some of those guys raised 100, 150 million dollars and didn't make it. So yeah. a lot of NAS and SAN companies that uh, didn't quite do it. I think you'll have the same thing happen here, but if you make it, you can make it big. Well, the, <laughs> the blueprint is, I mean, you, you saw in, in your class a, a great innovations, great companies, mm -hmm. Isilon, Data Domain, Compellent, 3PAR, and then ultimately they get sucked up by the whales. You mm -hmm. know, you see, and I think, you know, Larry Ellison started it. Yeah. Remember he used to say, you know, he used to denigrate other companies saying they're writing checks, not code. Mm -hmm. And then he changed the game. He yeah. started writing checks and He's, buying all these companies. He got more money and started and, and, the checks. And right? has made some good calls, yeah. right? I mean, they've become... I haven't heard that. That's a good company. one, Dave. That's, I yeah, like so, that one, uh, yeah. <laughs> hey, when you talk in the cube this morning... <laughs> you gotta, you gotta, you gotta have the lines <laughs> right but, um, fingertips. And, and, and so, uh, but do you think you'll ever see you know, a, a, a company sort of emerged from, from Startupville and actually gained critical mass. I guess NetApp was the last one, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, you guys had to think about it. Like, okay, hey, oh, we, we were, could, we we were could absolutely big, but, focused on but it. But then, yeah. you know, to get such an attractive offer, you've got to do what's best for your investors, right? So, well, and you're public, and, you know, you have to take care of the investors there. It's, um, the other thing is, uh, you got to get to scale as quick as you can. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't want to be a small player, because all the consolidation going on right now, the integration, you have to have the cloud to integrate with all these other vendors, and, uh, you know, by yourself, it's tough to get the attention to some of those things there. So it's going to be tough, but yeah. uh, it's it's always been. So, so still a lot of opportunities. will figure it out. Yeah. One of the things to to scale and to, to get bigger and not be a small player is people. So mm -hmm. how do you choose the right people? You had, with partners, very good relationships. Yeah. But, you know, when you start hiring. It's uh, it's it's critical to get that there. So, um, uh more eyes on the on the prize, so have more people interview them. Uh, make sure that's a cultural fit. You got to know what your culture is too. By the way, I think some people talk about their cultures, but they really don't know what it is. So did you write down your culture? Did you like? Did you have a, a, a statement? No, of we what said you two. Wanted? We said two words. It's positive aggressive. And, and, and that we, was we, always the we case. We talked about that the other day. It's yeah, always been exactly. the case, and uh, and it uh, it's real. I mean, you could see it from the customers. I think. Oh yeah. How they yeah. react in oh, the totally. audience. Here. It's not. Uh, it's not a casual relationship. So yeah. positive because it's like don't bash the competition. Talk about. Yeah. You, know, kind you of, can talk factually what's different yeah. between you and the competition, but you don't. You know, don't disparage them. That's a little bit my IBM roots too. You know, you don't disparage your competitors. Um, it's yeah. how each other work with each other. You want to uh, be collaborative as opposed to competitive. You want to compete, but you don't want to do it in a manner that you have somebody has to lose type thing, right? Um, so positive aggressive is, is pretty important. I found though that uh, when the, the people join the team, if they're not positive aggressive, they actually self-select out of the company eventually. It's kind of weird. Yeah. If they came from a very political environment, they kind of bring some of those habits and it just doesn't work after a while. And they leave, you know, because politics doesn't work as good, that type of thing. So, so that culture is really, really important. Um, 
And if you get the right culture, you're, they're gonna, you're gonna attract the right kind of people. So we did, uh, till the Dell acquisition, we really had not used headhunters. We'd mm -hmm. hired, you know, 500 some people, all from references and referrals from, from wow. employees. Yeah. We talked about this at VMworld. You said, hey, it's actually an advantage that we're in the middle of the country. We're mm -hmm. not competing with all these crazy, you know, the, the bubble in, in Silicon Valley, and, right. you know, and, and you know, we don't have to be in the East Coast. There's a lot of talent, former CDC, IBM. Yeah, yeah there's, uh, you know, Minneapolis, there used to be IBM and the bunch. And all but one of the bunch companies was based in Minneapolis. And people forget that. It was a really a strong, the, the, what happened though, it didn't develop a strong venture community. So that's where all the entrepreneurial, did, the money wasn't there, right? That number one of the three uh, bullets I talked about earlier. But really strong engineering talent, they're, uh, they're loyal. So if you do have a good culture, they stay there, they, they keep working for you. Uh, they work hard, you know, it's just a good, good place to do, do, do business, I think. And you see a little bit more technology started coming out of there. A lot of storage too, people don't realize that. You know, you had CNT and Seagate does all their high-end drive development. Uh, right, Cray, uh, yeah, there's, there's just a lot of, Q-Logic's got a big operation, Veritas, now yeah. Symantec, yep. Right. Can we back up for just a second? Mm -hmm. e earlier you said, you know, you've got to ask yourself whether it's uh, a feature or a business mm -hmm. and when you're determining investment, right? Um, well, in the web and software, that's a very easy determination. Yeah. But in the storage business, where where are those determining factors? Yeah. I think um, you could look at it a couple ways. One is, can you be a $100 million company? You know, if you have little features, you might get to 20 or 30, that kind of thing there. Um, I think it's kind of got to be a system, mm -hmm. otherwise it's probably going to be bought by somebody else. It's not going to last as a company. So, uh, you know, if you're going to, you know, make something a little bit better, it's probably got a feature. It's not a, okay. yeah, so I don't, I don't know how to, what the right way to look mm -hmm. at it, but uh, you can no, guys, I like you, that. when you see that's, it, you can tell it's it or not. You yeah. know? That's a good, yeah. good Makes angle, sense, right? Because yeah. you're right. If you feature company, maybe 10, 20 million, somebody will pick you up. Yeah. Um, a lot you of need that other company to make your sales too, right? You know, or a systems company, or you know, you got yeah. you got the whole thing to really provide a and, solution. And, for and people used to call you a feature company, but you're not. You weren't. A, you weren't and aren't a feature company. You had a lot of features. Yeah, feature rich. They used to say the same thing about three par, about data domain, mm -hmm. and uh, and and so you know you, you you see those all three of those companies got to you know 100 plus million. Yeah, you know, so that's a good good kind of benchmark there. But that's interesting. You said people were calling oh, yeah. them well, a feature company. The, well, is it easy to make that that mistake and and how you're uh, assessing it? The guys who didn't have the features were calling it a feature company. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> they were just trying to. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. He's our friend Joe Tucci. Joe Tucci who's been on the cube twice by the way and we love. But uh, he you know, hey, he's competing. He's like, yeah. oh, their feature companies will have it all. But the difference is is those guys they have a lot of those features, but I've talked to customers about them, and it's just it's not the same. They, they uh, yeah. I've talked to them. They don't turn them on. They, they may yeah. say they have, but they don't. You don't use it's them. a checkbox. Yeah. We got that too. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, it works, right? They can placate a lot of customers that yeah, way. Them, so. them talking about the the feature company. It's kind of I said it's Freudian, but you asked about interviewing. Yeah. Uh, another tip I give on interviewing is that if somebody brings something up multiple times in an interview, it's probably that. Uh, like if they say, I only want to work for an ethical company. Uh, I want to make sure it's, everyone's honest here, right? And uh -huh. After a while, you start going, you're dishonest. They, actually, they, they want to convince you that they are what they aren't, right? right. So it's uh, people people tell you a little bit from the, what they say as much as what they don't say. So Were you doing the hiring yourself? We did a lot like. of it, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I know you weren't using bigger. headhunters, but you personally. Oh, yeah. yeah. It, the, you know, the first, I don't know how many employees, I interviewed every one sure. of them. Sure, yeah. okay. So. At, at what point did you stop? Uh, we probably got to the 100 mark. He, he, okay. He started doing it. You always let the manager hire. I mean, I just was one of the interviewers. I wasn't okay. like the, yeah. you know, the you couldn't blackball anybody or whatever. You give your feedback because ultimately the, the manager's got to build their team, so you got to trust them there. Yeah. And then you have to find the right person to do that, to that's trust. Right. <laughs> yeah, that first layer is uh, real, real important. Yeah, that's for it really sure. is. And, and those are the strong personalities. You've got to make sure that they... Uh, they fit the culture too. Yeah, yeah, they're gonna, they're the ones that are gonna do that for you. If if there's one pitfall that a startup makes mm -hmm. in all of that we've talked about and even that we haven't, where where do you think that one point is? Well, that, I that, mean that's, that's a that's a hard question. <laughs> huh? Sorry, um, <laughs> should have handed it to you on a piece of paper. Why is that? Because there's you know, so many. You know, I, <laughs> probably. I, I kind of hit a little bit there. Uh, people tend to I'll get to the distribution later. Okay. And I, you know. Start thinking about that in the, in the original business plan. While you're developing the product, you yeah. should really be, be just as innovative on how you're going to distribute, how you get the word out. And nowadays, there's so many ways to do it. I mean, 
look at this right, right. there. Yeah. The social media. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's so many unique ways that are inexpensive or free mm -hmm. that uh, I'd start right away. Okay. Create a buzz. Yeah. Get it going. Cool. So you done? With done the, innovating? With the show? No. no. Oh, I've done, no. done, <laughs> done like startups. starting company. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think. Uh, wow, that I, was a rude way to get them off. I think, yeah. Are you done yet? Okay. <laughs> get out of here. Cal, you got something better over there? They, um, it, it, it takes a lot of energy to do this. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're taking the calls at midnight on Saturday when those first few systems go out. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I don't see myself doing any other companies. But uh, see if we can get this one to the billion dollar mark for Pradell and see what happens after that's that. That's the that's the milestone. Yeah. Can... I may we talked. I may do some do something in more philanthropic areas or something like that. But no plans yet. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Well, thanks very much for well, all your support you here. And you can I ask one more question? You we bet. don't have to let him go right now. No. no um. Right. So you were talking a little bit uh, about the customer that made you tear up here mm -hmm. at uh, the Dell Storage Forum, and uh, I was wondering if you could go into a little bit more detail on that. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was actually one of the business partners, but he. Uh, we had the Q and A session, you know, on the, after the keynote, and uh, so we'd had several questions. It was kind of like the last question, you know, you always hear that when the mics are being passed around, and and uh, you know, Winslow Technology Group, Scott Winslow, stood up and uh, just uh, said, "Hey, we want. I want to thank you. I started a business based on you guys, and it, it wasn't the product. It was kind of you guys, you know, the team." And uh, he mentioned my 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 partners and uh, and Brian Bell and Marty Sanders. You know, he works really closely with there, Scott Horst, and. Uh, Mike Beach, but he said, um, you know, I started a business on you, risked everything on it, and you guys have always been there for me, you know, helped me out when I needed it, uh, kind of worked there. And my customers took a lot of risks. They bet their careers when they bought your product, and wow. you've always gone above and beyond them. So um, it, was, it was just pretty neat, and that's kind of the way you ended the, it was kind of like, uh, I, I joked that was my brother that just talked there, right? But it was... It was kind of like it was, almost looked planned, it, but it wasn't. It was uh, hmm. very, very, very neat to hear that. So, so basically, he was ri he he risked by bu by buying yeah. everything, his family, his kids. Yeah. He used to he used to be a salesman house. for large yeah. storage vendors, yeah. and now he's starts his own reseller business, and now he's got I don't know is it 12, 14 employees, and yeah, you know so yeah, that's awesome. It's really neat. It was neat. Can we see that's those? Really, that's really neat to. Uh, the impact you have on people is very important. You know, yeah. your employees and uh, customers, and so that's why it. Uh, that's what makes me motivate. That motivates me. It's a big part I of why you do that. it. That's it, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. It's a school teacher, right? You still want to help exactly. help the kids, right? <laughs> oh, these are big kids now. Yeah. <laughs> do you miss right. teaching? I, I do miss it a little bit. I can tell I like presenting, so that's why yes. it's probably teaching. My I, I coached all those years, so. though, too. So yeah. yeah, you were saying, tell, yeah. telling me that. I thought it was baseball, but uh, was that, you told me it was basketball. Yeah, basketball, football, and, and uh, no, softball. Oh. I had an article written that I coached softball. I've never coached softball. Oh, really? Yeah. So <laughs> basketball, football. football. Yeah, I did a little bit of volleyball, but those are the two big ones, basketball and uh, you football. You played hoops? And played hoops, your day. yeah. And Denver, football? Denver South High School. Played football. I was more of a tennis player, though. That was a split end. So you didn't do a, a slow, a slow, good hands. Didn't do baseball because yeah. you were playing tennis. Right? Yeah, so. tennis is the the big summer sport. I'll give you a thumbs up on the tennis. Yeah. And you still play that's tennis, good. right? That as well. Yeah, my, that's how my wife and I met. We both went to uh, college on tennis scholarships. And wow. Yeah, do you golf too? I golf, not very good. But I golf. Yeah. <laughs> good, let's play. I know. Not very good. Either. Uh, <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to say no, you I'm are terrible. good. No, I'm so terrible. you can just. He crush looks him. like he's playing all the time, doesn't yeah. he? Yeah, he does. I know. Tan, like fit, look like he's ready sun, to go. I know. Nice it's nothing to do yeah. with golf, right? You see my golf game, you'll yeah. know I don't play much golf. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll check it out sometime. <laughs> and you're a tennis player then. I was. Uh, it was one of my. F I, I used to play all, every sport on the planet. Mm -hmm. I, just I was a tomboy when I was growing up, so tennis was one of my favorite ones. Good. Yeah. yeah. Well, good. All right. Well, Thanks a lot, you guys. You. It was fun hanging with you. Phil. Good seeing you again. Pleasure. Thanks, we Thanks really for everything. Appreciate it. All right. I, I wish we were back tomorrow so we could have you back. I know. <laughs> Come out to Minneapolis. We'll do it daily. All a right. daily Sounds show. Good. Yes. <laughs> Come Phil up and build a studio, right? right